What's up and welcome in to Fantasy Baseball today on Thursday, December 7th. I am Frank Sample, joined by Scott White and Chris the Welsh. Today on the show, we are looking at the top 10 outfield prospects entering 2024, including the top proximity names that you need to know for redraft leagues next year. And we do have some news to get to, but you won't hear any of our thoughts on Juan Soto and that crazy trade and Craig Kimbrell, Eduardo Rodriguez, because we've already done an emergency podcast. So if you're looking for that, go check it out. You can find out all of our thoughts. If we're being honest, we're kind of working double duty because we just wrapped up that live stream. <laughs> now we're starting up a new podcast, but here we are. Welsh, obviously the outfield is loaded with tons of prospects, amazing players. We could have done a top 25, a top 50, but like we do with all these, we'll limit it to 10 outfield prospects. Great position. How about this? We didn't get outside of my top 25 overall prospects with 10 outfielders. That's how that's how far we didn't go and how deep the position should be, by the way. Mm -hmm. we, if we're going to play so many, we want so many good ones. It, there's an interesting kind of break in the tiers of these guys where, I mean, we're talking like elite, elite players at this tippy top. Uh, we have five of these names are also inside my top 10. The talent pool kind of, it alters a little bit, but all the way through the top 100, I think I'm doing rough math here and how I have this on my sheet, around 34 outfielders, 35 outfielders in my top 100. Obviously the pools kind of change, but you're talking from high-end AFL, big performances to young players that are waiting for big breakouts to just overall huge production. It's tons and tons of talent. And like shortstop, two things, you can feel comfortable. About. Don't worry about your own. Oh, I don't have a catcher on my prospect dynasty. I don't, I don't have a second, but who cares? Have shortstops and have outfielders and maybe a pitcher or two. And you're good to go. And you can figure it all out later because there are a lot of great players. And there are quite a few players that have real, real legitimate chances uh, in this spot to play, not just next year, but like opening day. Yeah. And I was going to surprise you and just tack on some other outfield names, but to be honest, once we get outside of your top 10, I mean, there's a few others in there, but the deeper you go, it's a lot of names that are like farther away. Like yeah. we're talking like two, three years away. So I think it's fine to kind of omit those names for now. And as they get closer to the bigs, that's when we can start talking about them. Let's start up top with your number one ranked outfield prospect. That is Wyatt Langford from the Texas Rangers. That's right. The rich get richer because the Rangers just won the World Series. And they are about to add this guy. I mean, as soon as opening day, which is crazy to say, Wyatt Langford was the fourth overall pick in this year's draft. He just turned 22 years in no, uh, years old in November. And he only got 44 games in. It's a small sample. I get that. He destroyed. He destroyed at every level. 360 batting average, 10 homers, 12 steals, and 1157 OPS. He had more walks than strikeouts across four different levels. He got five games in at AAA. Well, so we're looking at a potential five category contributor and maybe as soon as opening day based on early ADP, his ADP is 164 since November 1st. I mean, people are basically drafting him like he's there on opening day. Do you agree? Yeah. I mean, he is being baked in for that because, but here's the thing it's being baked in of like, yeah, we trust that he's going to be up soon. If we were given the announcement that Wyatt Langford was making, making the opening day roster, we are back into old school Bobby Witt, where it was. Remember, I was like, "Oh, it's gonna be top seventy-five, blah blah." Wyatt Langford would one hundred percent be going inside the top one hundred, probably in the sixty to seventy-five range. And now I'm not saying I'm not trying to argue if that's right or wrong, but it's a little bit different than like the Corbin Carroll or Gunnar Henderson situation because we haven't seen it happen at the major league level, but we did see the ultimate press of what. Um, teams are going to give us in the minor leagues. Jackson Holiday, four levels. Wyatt Langford, four levels. He was able to push all the way through, all the way up into AAA. He actually skipped a ball. I was actually at his debut, which is pretty cool. You can go see it on my timeline, um, on my Twitter. You can search it. I was at his first and third game, and you can see the hard hit. He hit 300 at least at every single level in like barely over 100 games, um, or I'm sorry, 100 at-bats, like 160 at-bats. He ended up having double-digit homers and stolen bases. 
Prospects Live has uh, some of the AAA StatCast data. He hit a 111.5 max EV just in AAA, which is pretty great. 95th percentile was almost 108, which is pretty crazy. Barrel percentage wasn't up there, but just remind you, this is just a dude that barely got here. And uh, the power speed combo, the way he approaches the ball, it's advanced. And the team has said they're going to give him op every opportunity, which might be at DH. So he, yes, he's baked in, but he's baked in of like, yeah, we're pretty sure. If it was affirmative, he will go inside the top 100. So if you're doing early drafts, you kind of have to make that concerted effort. And, you know, Frank, you and I were talking about this in your, um, what was it called? The Dominator, Terminator, <laughs> Existentialator? What was it? A, a Gladiator draft. Gladiator, the Gladiator draft. Like you have to like make the choice here. And you were like putting me to the test with some of these. And I'm like, listen, I think Jackson Churio makes it. I think Wyatt Langford makes it. And I also think a guy like Jackson Holiday. I think those are three guys that these teams have to consider a for the play B for the positional open openings they have and C for the extra compensation. So yes, uh, Wyatt Langford ADP, it does make sense. And if you're a little bit of a risk taker, you're actually not going high enough. Scott, I get that Wyatt Langford was the fourth overall pick. So obviously he has that pedigree and he crushed it's also a really small sample size. So there is a bit of skepticism here for me that, you know, a guy has played 44 games in the minors. We're taking him at picks 164. <laughs> it sounds mm -hmm. a little crazy. What do you think about that early price tag? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm actually going through my outfield prospect rankings right now. This is, this is the, the first of these prospect podcasts we've done where I'm actually somewhat caught up. I've actually studied the position to a degree. I haven't actually finalized my rankings, but my initial inclination is to put Jackson Chorio ahead of Wyatt Langford. Uh, and I know on a previous podcast, Chris, you said that you view Wyatt Langford as the number one overall prospect. So ahead of Jackson holiday. No, so, no, I do not. That that's oh, okay. actually a lot of people do feel that a lot way. I don't, I'm Jackson holiday. And I will, I, I just want to agree with you for a second. I think Wyatt Langford and, and Jackson Churio are neck and neck. The, the sheer magnitude of what Wyatt Langford did with those hard hit numbers, excelling at every level. And by the way, I didn't even mention he walked more than he struck than out he struck and out, he did yeah. not strike out a whole lot you take every element of that on a world series team you go and throw him and you let him hit five or six it's absurd but churio is also kind of this other beast with the strikeout numbers and stuff some people think there's a tier difference with white langford i don't i think holiday langford and churio are a clumped tier of incredibleness that mm -hmm. i'm not going to kill you if you go in one different direction and i don't think I, I don't think it's crazy for you to say you would prefer Churio over Langford because there's also a bigger track record. And, and I kind of think Junior Camonero is in that group too. But uh, but getting back to to Wyatt Langford and and you know why why my again my knee jerk reaction is to put him behind uh, Jackson Churio still, and I'm, I'm I'm trying to decide why I'm doing that. Like, is it just I've been hearing about Jackson, been salivating over Jackson Holiday and Jackson Chorio for so long that uh, it just feels like it just feels rash to put White Langford ahead of them. It is only 44 games. Minor league samples are always pretty small. And it's 44 games where at every single level, Wyatt Langford dominated. So it's not like he was hot for two weeks. And then they moved him up to tougher competition and uh, he cooled off and it just, it just didn't reflect in the numbers yet because he didn't get enough time at that new level. He like everywhere he went, uh, Wyatt Langford was a monster. His slash line, 360, 480, 677. It's a video game. Um, I, he did steal 12 bases. He actually had more steals than home runs, but. I'm also not totally confident that's going to be a part of his game. It's a majors. big, thick guy. You look at him and you don't see a player that is going to steal like 20 bases. It's really actually hard to process when you see him in person. And he didn't, he wasn't a big base dealer in college. Uh, so I don't know. Like, I don't know. I mean, he, he, he seems almost too good to be true. 
<laughs> you know, I just I just want more data. So before I commit to Wyatt Langford as the number one overall prospect, I think that's all it is. Um, because you know, if I if I make this move of putting him ahead of the Jacksons, Holiday and Chorio, and he doesn't like he does come crashing back to earth. Like it, I'll feel like I should have known better, right? When if it turns out he's better than those two, I mean, he's just good on him. They're all, they'll all probably be great. I don't know. That that's where I stand with Wyatt Langford. I and you know that I'm not trying to take a negative stance with him because he's an amazing prospect. He should have a strong fantasy impact in 2024. Um, but I I don't know. I guess since we're kind of talking about number two on the Welsh's list here, Chori, I'll, I'll get into this a little bit. You know, he just signed that eight year, 82 million dollar deal with the Brewers, which in my mind virtually guarantees he's on the opening day roster. They want that draft pick. They want the chance at the the bonus draft pick, which they can only get if he's on the opening day roster and they don't have to consider service time issues because he's already, you know, locked up his salary for the eight next, next eight years. So I think it virtually guarantees it. And with that news in, in my redraft rankings, I moved Jackson Chorio up to 21 in my outfield rankings. I, I still don't have Wyatt Langford anywhere close to that, in part because we don't actually know if he's going to be on the opening day roster. If we find out, he'll probably move up quite a bit as well. Um, so my, my like I'm thinking of that hypothetical, if we did find out, okay, Wyatt Langford's on the opening day roster. If we found that out tomorrow, would I move him up as high as 21? I don't think I would. And so what does that say about how I should rank the two comparatively just as prospects? You know, I, I don't know. I, I feel like I feel like Langford should be behind. Last point on Langford. If you take the steamer projections and just prorate them over 600 plate appearances, they have him hitting 262 with 23 homers, 14 steals and an 809 OPS. I mean, that that is already a productive player in his rookie season. So just to put some perspective around Wyatt Langford. Uh, Welsh, last question on him. Is he your number one player in first-year player drafts ahead of Yoshi Yamamoto? Yes. Um, dynasty hitters over pitchers always. And Yamamoto might be more productive this year, might be more productive next year. Might, I think it's a big question. But when in doubt, go with the hitting prospects here. Uh, points leagues might be a tiny bit different, uh, I suppose. But I like Langford, and it took a lot for me to put Langford over Dylan Cruz because I like Dylan Cruz more than most other people because I think he is a great, pure hitter, even though his debut wasn't uh, as magnificent. But uh, answered yes over Yamamoto. Well, if we're going to bring up points leagues, I mean, Wyatt Langford, it seems like that would be his format with yeah. the exceptional plate discipline. So uh, maybe that's a scenario where you do go Langford over Chorio, his points league specifically. Yeah, OBP too, OBP leagues. Yeah. Your number two ranked outfield prospect, no surprise, and already mentioned Jackson Churio with the Milwaukee Brewers. Scott and I have talked about him a lot recently because he signed that eight-year, $82 million extension with its incentives that could max out at $140 million over 10 years. This season, as a 19-year-old at mostly double-A, Jackson Churio hit 282 with 22 homers, 44 steals, and an 805 OPS. Brewers GM Matt Arnold said, that Churio will have a chance to make the team's opening day roster. It sounds like I would think that's pretty likely at this point. There have been three NFBC drafts since Churio, uh, since the extension was announced late last week. His ADP is up to 142, 30th outfielder off the board. Welsh, what do you think about that price tag for Jackson Churio? Yeah, I mean, again, we're we're pushing the limits but I'm open to taking a little bit more risk in the later rounds. I think the upside is great uh, in that mock that we did. A credit to me, fifth outfielder, Jackson Churio later. No big deal, but you're not getting him at this price now. It, it Outfield is a weird spot. Like at 140, there's scenarios where he could be your outfielder too, which you don't really love because I think there's inherent risk. Outfielder three is a better spot. Listen, I love Churio. I'm not, even though I'm saying, I'm on record saying like, I think Jackson Churio, breaks camp pat murphy is kind of a hardo like he i love him he was a coach at asu for a long time but he like they asked him about it and he's like i told him he has to earn it he's like he's number 94 to me he's like i will put that number 11 jersey that he wants to wear in my office and i'll and he can stare at it every day until he earns it 
I'm not saying it's going to do anything. The organization is to be like, Hey, cool, Pat, that's great. But we want a first round pick. So I don't care what you think. That's a possibility because this is a magnificent talent, but you know, he is definitely still a young guy. Strikeouts aren't um, any type of crazy problem. Walk numbers. I'll be very curious, like where that ends up going long-term, but um, Jackson trio put up big heart hit numbers in a very short sample size in triple a around 57% according to prospect prospects lives data, which is nice, but 40 plus stolen bases, the 20 homer marker, it's everything that you want. Um, there's a big aggressive uppercut swing that he puts into a lot of this stuff. Pull rates probably need to improve. Uh, he kind of lowered as he went, ended at 43% in AAA. So I'd like to see that go a little bit higher. And the ground ball rate was 52% at AAA. So I think that's also about his approach. And I think that's what the teams that have to come to terms with. Like how advanced of a hitter do they believe he is now playing in the Dominican Winter League is a great thing. <laughs> Junior Caminero is dominating. I think he had the second most homers in the Dominican Winter League, and uh, I think Churio had some time there as well. So it's all positives. I'm not trying to be negative. It's just like we're pushing ish the limits on the 140 range. And I know I kind of like, hey, Linkford's going to go inside the top 100. He'll, he'll go around 100 and maybe even a little bit further with those stolen bases if they give a guarantee, but I don't think you're going to get a guarantee. So you've got to take a risk I like the risks. Uh, I'm willing to do it around the one hundreds. I don't know. It's a little bit dicey. So you mentioned the strikeout rate for Jackson Chorio not being such a problem. And I, I got to say that is the improvement he made with the strikeout rate this past year is a big reason why I'm so optimistic about Jackson Chorio. I was kind of a skeptic with him prior to that. He struck out in 2022, lower levels of the minor still. He struck out 27% of the time, pretty high, yeah. pretty scary against mostly fastballs because he was in the lower levels moved up the ladder. Obviously this past year spent, I think most of the season at double a spent more time at double a than anywhere else. So that the biggest leap you can take from one level to the next in the minors facing a, wi a wider variety of pitches, more off speed stuff, more breaking stuff. And he cut that 27% strikeout rate from 2022 down to 17.8%, like drastic improvement, even as he was facing a much higher level of competition. And so I think that that's when I, that that's when now I'm all in on Chorio. Now I'm all yeah. in on Chorio just based on that. You talk through it, you know, interesting too, that um, it's such a small sample size to look at anything, but in the triple a hit a like under 9% swinging uh, strike percentage, which is pretty impressive too. You could think that might be a place where you unload a cut again. It's like six or seven games or whatever, but you might think, yeah, we're going to unload some swings here. That didn't happen. Churio easily can, I, I can foresee him doing the things that we saw from like Corbin Carroll. I don't think he can be Corbin Carroll necessarily. I think it could go more the path of Gunnar Henderson. I think there might be an adjustment period that he will get back through and I think it is highly likely he could touch. Maybe it's similar to like that first Bobby Witt season. 2030 seems within the realm of possibility if they are committed and you'd love to see them maybe move a little bit of that outfield because I, I don't want them to feel um, I don't want them to be tempted to do something else. I, I want them to be all in on Churio. The contract is one piece, but I want Pat Murphy to be all in as well. I was watching some highlights too. the the power for Churio just feels like it comes so easy like all swing generated power, it's beautiful. Like, yeah he can you know he could pull it he could go the opposite field I, I saw home runs to all over the park so i obviously that's going to play pretty well out there in milwaukee as well your number three outfield prospect is dylan cruz for the washington nationals the second overall pick in this year's draft turns just 22 years old in february he got 35 games in after being drafted and he hit 292 with five homers four steals in 844 ops uh, but did struggle quite a bit in 20 games at double A. Obviously, it's a very small sample size. I don't think we care too much about that. But this is an elite college bat known for power and speed. I think on a very clearly different timeline here than uh, Wyatt Langford. A, because Langford was just so ridiculous, uh, even better, obviously, than, than Dylan Cruz was. And B, the Nationals are nowhere close to competing yet. So it just doesn't really make sense to push him. Uh, Welsh. Your thoughts on Dylan Cruz and I guess the timeline. Is there a chance? I don't know. Maybe he's like a second half call up August, September, something like that. Yeah. See, that's a tricky thing though. You know, the one thing I would argue with some of these teams like this. Yeah, sure. You don't bring these guys up because you're nowhere away, blah, blah, blah. 
But like, if you have a guy that could net you that compensation pick, you should consider it. Think about like, you will have teams not trade really great players because, oh, well, we can get the compensatory pick if they sign somewhere else. And it's like, that's more valuable than trading him for blah, blah, blah. All right, well, now put that into perspective of a player that can help you now and can be up from day one and get you a compensatory pick if you feel he's ready. That's my argument in that. I'm not sure he proved that because he did struggle a little bit at the end. This one, not everybody will like because obviously I we haven't said Evan Carter yet. He's next. And Evan Carter has proximity. I think there's still some power questions. And I think he had like one total extra base hit the entire season uh, against lefties. So, I mean, you know, there's a little bit of platoon struggles in there on him. I think Dylan Cruz is a monster of a hitter. And I actually think this is very reminiscent of like that first Bobby Witt Jr. year. Bobby Witt Jr. was very mediocre. Batting average, eh, kind of striking out in rookie ball. Like he was okay. He was fine. And he was even older for the competition. Dylan Cruz was fine. You know, he won game at rookie ball. Get him the hell out of here. Go to A ball, dominate. Gets to double A, little bit more struggles. He jumped over high A. That's the thing to point out, by the way. His struggles came when he jumped the level to A ball. It's a big ask, but he is a hard hit opposite field type of guy. Put up like 107s opposite field on Max EV. Uh, he can pull the ball, has a great, again, this is one of those like big pull generated swings. He can run. Um, I think this is 25, 25 on the low end, hitting in the middle of an order. I think he's a five category player. I love the talent of Dylan Cruz, and I'm betting on that regardless of recency results we get very focused on like well this is what this guy did now and it's like okay well dylan cruz has been maybe the best college player for years and he's coming over and he's he's gonna get back there outside of maybe the nationals screwing things up because their development seems wonky well coming out of the draft i think the consensus was dylan cruz is even better than wyatt langford and and it was just the the disparate performances between the two that now have wyatt langford as uh, as the top guy over, Cruz. I had Cruz over him. You're 100 percent right. I, I think, think it's hard people. to deny where Langford is, but like I I I think the gap isn't as far as some people have it. Yeah. Um, I gotta ask. So in the Scott White Dynasty League, uh oh, <laughs> you have you have the number two overall pick in the minor league draft, which is more or less a, a first year player draft, at least to the beginning of it is. You have the number two pick. I have the number three pick. Let's say. Wyatt Langford goes one overall. Don't tell him, Welsh. Are Don't you tell taking him. Paul Skeens or are you taking Dylan Cruz? Who are you Don't leaving me with? Well, that, see, and that's interesting. Yeah, I might have to make you sweat because that's points league and Paul Skeens is a bit more interesting. It's a 24 team points league where people never have enough pitching. And this guy over here, I have struggled in the building of this team, which I do have Otani. And I do have quite a nice outfield of Corbin Carroll, Luis Robert, and someone I'm not thinking of right now. And I sure struggle with pitching. So I don't know if I quite have an answer for you there, Scott, but maybe you might be able to line in where I might be I've going. I've been counting on getting Dylan Cruz at number three. Cause yeah, I think it's really hard. It's hard to pass on a guy like Dylan Cruz. I mean, the, you're, the, the format of your league specifically oh, in no, 24... The, the, there's no way you'd pass on him at number three. It's just, it's just, is somebody, is, is some, one of the two people picking ahead of me, one of them being you going to go for the, the, the big pitching prospect. It the was bigger, the number one overall pick in the draft last. The year. bigger question is, can we get the number one person to take Paul Skeens <laughs> or Dylan Cruz? Can we do that? And I, can that's take, RJ white. He's, he's, he's can we get RJ. I, I don't think he's going to go against the Wyatt Langford consensus, but I yeah, just you. pitching in a 24 team points league, uh, is really hard to come by and having like really high end yeah. pitchers. And for me to have like Max Meyer and Paul Skeens coming up here very shortly is probably pretty tantalizing, but it's a very good question. And I do just think that like, Dylan Cruz is underrated. He's he's underrated. And I think there is a possibility that midway through this year, we're like, man, can you believe that Dylan Cruz was in a completely another tier from Wyatt Langford? I'm not saying it's going to happen, well, but you're, I think you're that's underrated, but he's still going to be a consensus top 10 overall prospect. Dylan yeah. Cruz. Yeah. Uh, underrated in that. Like everyone's like, eh. Dylan Cruz, what are you talking about? Give me Yamamoto, yeah. give me Langford, maybe give me Skeens. Like they look at him as like, well, this is what I had left over. And I just don't think Dylan Cruz is leftovers. I think he's uh, I think he's a meal. Your third outfielder, by the way, in the Scott White Dynasty League, Masataka Yoshida. That's it. That's who is it. amazing in a points league. So uh yeah, 
Corbin Carroll, Luis Robert, and Yoshida. That's a uh, pretty pretty good outfit. I need I need to get some pitching. I got Otani as my DH. I'm doing all right, but pitching stinks. It's hard. It's 24 teams. Let's yeah. cut some people out. Relegate them. <laughs> get rid of them. <laughs> all right, let's uh, take our first break. When we return, we'll uh, get to Evan Carter. We'll talk about Jason Dominguez. We'll do that right after this. <laughs> Welcome back in, and let's get to the rest of the Welsh's top outfield prospects. I love that during the break, Welsh, you turned the hat around, and now we see the Savannah the bananas. bananas. There you go. Shout out to the Savannah Bananas. Hook your brother up. I'm a, I'm a fan. I'm supporting the hat. I love this hat, and the backwards might be the uh, most ridiculously awesome part of this hat that I can flip it back. So come on the YouTube over here on Fantasy Baseball today and check out my official Savannah Bananas hat. If I heard correctly on MLB Network recently, from Jake Peavy. He said that the Savannah Bananas are going to play some kind of, I guess, exhibition game in, in Fenway Park. And uh, Jake Peavy was lobbying to pitch in that game. So. I think he pitched already for the Savannah Bananas yeah. in a game. Did That's you know awesome. last, uh, like it was like April, they were coming here to Phoenix. They were playing in surprise six weeks out. I was like, That's great. I'm going to get tickets sold out. I mean, they are they are a sensation. It was weeks wow. and weeks and weeks sold out before. So shout out to my boys, the banana, uh, Savannah Bananas. It's like the the Harlem Globetrotters of baseball. You That's how it. I explained it to my mother-in-law. That's exactly how I explained it. The number four outfield prospect is Evan Carter from the Texas Rangers. He just uh, He's just 21 years old, doesn't turn 22 until next August. And we saw what he did when he came up late in the year for the Rangers. Played only 23 games, but he hit 306, five homers, three steals, and OPS over 1,000. What did he do in the postseason? He hit 300, only one homer, but he still ran quite a bit. He had three steals, 917 OPS in the postseason. By the end of the World Series, he was batting, what, third, fourth in the Rangers lineup. Lots to like here, Welsh. The problem, this early price tag, it's a bit prohibitive. I mean, we're talking about a 126 ADP. People are excited. I do share some of the concerns that you mentioned. Wh what kind of power do we get this year? He has struggled against lefties in the past. I love him long term. Don't get me wrong, but like this season, I don't know. We might be pushing him a little bit too too fast. Yeah, I think I even got ahead of myself. I mean, because this was a guy I was like, we already got our rookie of the year early candidate, Evan Carter, and I don't think that necessarily goes away. I mean, you hit three and four as a rookie in the world series for the Texas Rangers with, you know, here hitting behind Corey Seager and Marcus Simeon, that says a lot about what that hit tool is, but ultimately what the big impact is. I think that's still open for interpretation. You know, five homers. It is impressive in the 62 games. He hit 300 at the majors. Like, I don't want to take anything away from that, but you know, there are worries about like how, how great of impact will the power be hit 420 at bats. He had 13 homers in the minors. He stole 26 bases, which is pretty good. So, you know, 18 homers, 29 stolen bases on the year. I just wonder if he's more close to like a 15, 20 guy and he hits for a high average, probably good runs and RBI. And, you know, I'll throw it to the next guy. I, this is definitely injury related. I love Jason Dominguez. If Jason Dominguez were completely healthy, I might have him at three. Uh, and that's how highly I think of just the impact and how he's changed his game. I mean, you want to talk about hard hit. It probably starts with Wyatt Langford and then Jason Dominguez too. And then uh, I think probably bigger, harder hit numbers with Jason than with Churio. But the in, I'm very dicey about this injury with Jason Dominguez. I'm concerned about like, how is that going to hold him back? So these are two in theory proximity guys. And I think of all the players we've talked about uh, and, and I'm adding Jason into this piece of the conversation, five outfielders. I think Evan Carter has the highest likelihood to be the worst counting stats player of all of them, the extremes, I, do, I just, and again, Corbin Carroll was able to do it. I don't think Evan Carter is in that same like general, you know, vicinity. I'm, I'm was laying out like the ISO was this and pure power. Evan Carter is not the pure power guy. I think he's a capped 20 homer type of player. And if the stolen bases go up, guess what? He is Kyle Tucker. So maybe that is the upside of him being Kyle Tucker. I'm just not sure because he can't hit lefties right now. And that's going to be a problem. And they have a lot of options White Langford being one of them for potential platoons. So I got Carter at four. Some people might want him at three, but I could legitimately with just a, a not injured Jason Dominguez, have him at five. With 
Evan Carter. I was going to um forgot what I was gonna point out. I was gonna point out something on Evan Carter and now it is escaping me. But the skinny guy me, then I, I will uh I will remind you. I had serious doubts about his power potential when when they called him up. His readiness and his power potential because you know he was only 21 years old, uh had played only eight games at triple A, looked underdeveloped physically still looks underdeveloped physically I, I just didn't think there'd be enough punch in his swing but he surprised me you know five home runs in 23 regular season games one home run in 17 playoff games but also nine doubles to go with that home run and uh showed a willingness to run uh i don't think the upside is in the same vicinity as dylan cruz so i'm with you that there's there's no need to rank Evan Carter ahead of Dylan Cruz. The best thing Evan Carter has going for him is on base ability, which is more valuable in real life than in fantasy, unless you're talking a points league or an OBP league, in which case maybe bump Evan Carter up a little, but still not ahead of Dylan Cruz. So uh, I think he's perfectly fine here, and um, hopefully he continues to con- continues the trend of of maximizing his power projection yeah and if you just sorry i just was add 46 percent hard hit rate 10 percent barrel rate was actually really impressive low launch angle and i would be probably future paying attention to how do those poll numbers look because that's the type of 10 percent barrel rate with 40 mid 40s hard hit if you pull the ball he might step himself into 30 like a kyle tucker would so like that's where things are open he just doesn't have that same hit tool so sorry frank no, no, it's all good. I, I mean, I think that's a good point. Uh, he did pull the ball a lot in his small sample, so may, he might be able to pull it off in kind of an Alex bregman type way where he can get to like 25 home runs if he just pulls the ball a ton. I, I did want to point out, I think he might be even better in a points league too because his, while he does strike out quite a bit, his walk rates have been great. He has an amazing yeah, eye at the plate. It, I mean, it's almost like I just said that, Frank. Oh, gosh darn it. <laughs> All right, well, <laughs> number five outfield prospect is Jason Dominguez. So let's talk about him. A whirlwind of a year for Jason Dominguez. You know, I was just thinking the whole time, what was I going to say? What was I going to say? And I guess I forgot. I, I was supposed to be listening to Scott. Uh, well, anyway, Jason Dominguez, a uh, a 20-year-old, I might add, as well. Just, again, whirlwind of a season. Got off to the slow start in the minors. It got to July. The dude just flipped the switch. The overall numbers, he actually... Wound up picking them up quite a bit. He hit 265, 15 homers, 40 steals in the minors, and then got called up to the Yankees in September. His very first swing in the majors, he hit a home run off of future Hall of Famer Justin Verlander. It's like losing my mind at the time. He only plays eight games with the Yankees. He hit four home runs. He stole a base. He had a 980 OPS, and then he's torn, uh, diagnosed with a torn UCL in his right elbow. Surgery on September 20th. Expected recovery is nine to 10 months. So I think there's a chance we could see him post all-star break or maybe not because there is this report that came out just recently that Aaron Boone is not guaranteeing Jason Dominguez the center field job post recovery. Uh, Maybe it's just coach speak, whatever it's, the winter meetings, they need something to talk about. I mean, you bring Verdugo and Grisham in too to go along with Soto and Judge. And it's like this year, that might be what he's talking about this year. Yeah. So, I mean, I do kind of worry about there's a chance the Yankees just kind of hold them down, and then we're looking at 2025, Scott. So what do you think about, does Dominguez actually, I don't know, make any impact this year? I mean, he was he was such a bombshell when he got called up, did so much good in that short span of time that I, I'm sure they're going to be counting down the days till he returns. Like he's, he's better than Alex Verdugo, I feel pretty confident saying. And, you know, who knows? Like, we're talking three months into the season, at least like who knows what's going to have befallen the Yankees lineup by that point. I I think, I think we're going to see plenty of Jason Dominguez in the second half and um, how, how stashable is he in the meantime? I obviously depends on the depth of your league and, and how many IL spots you have to play with. I don't think he's going to, I don't think he's must draft even in all five outfielder leagues, but I think you're going to want to keep a close eye on his progress. If he is sitting out there on the waiver wire all year. Welsh, I know you love Jason Dominguez. You just talked about that, but given just kind of the up and down nature we've seen from him in the minors and then 
taking the league by storm for like eight games, whatever it was, I would make the argument that it's the perfect time to kind of cash in. I, I don't know what that looks like. I mean, obviously you have to get a ton for him in dynasty leagues, but like there has been a lot of up and down. What do you think about a potential sell high on Dominguez? What I think is funny about that is that is level three of cashing in on Jason Dominguez. If people have paid attention, <laughs> level I one guess. was he's the biggest prospect. He's the Martian sell. Then it was come back and start to hit again. Sell. You're up at the major. And now this, so, like th there's all these points where everyone's like, sell, sell. How many more times will he do this? I'm not going to disagree. Maybe he's just Th really good. Yeah, maybe he's just that's really why the, good. But that's, I don't that's why those sell high opportunities keep coming up. I wouldn't sell right now. If you were going to do it, do it right before he's about to come back. And maybe he goes to the minors. That's when you do it. I personally kind of don't want to sell. I'd want to hold. I actually think this is a buy right now because I think his cost is going to be lower. Yankees just filled up their outfield. There's some dissent among, oh, maybe he's not going to be the guy. He's got this elbow. I don't have him higher. Because I am in this and I rank way more to the future than like a lot of people. A lot of people are way more proximity. I'm a little bit worried because I don't know what this looks like. This is really important, like learning maturation, like him adjusting to the league and stuff. And he's missing this time. UCL stuff scares me just in general. It doesn't matter for who. So I just don't know what it, how far does this set him back? So that's like a little bit of the trepidation because we also want him to be hitting better. But yeah, like, the guy's like monster hard hit numbers. He runs like crazy in the AFL. He couldn't get, it was no luck. I didn't, I should have looked what was his Babbitt. It was probably like a hundred such bad luck, big hard hit kept not working out for him, but the dude kept stealing and stealing. he's a big dude. He's going to steal 40 bases every single year. And it looks like he has the potential to hit 30 homers. It's just gonna be, where is the average? So I think he's massively talented to me. This is not the time to sell. I understand why you would. I'm looking to buy and it's actually kind of tough actually having this conversation. I'm looking because it's like, man, should I just put Jason where I feel his talent is versus some of these factors? And if that's the case, it would be over Evan Carter for sure. And it might be over Dylan Cruz. So I have to deal with that in the offseason. All right. Well, we hit on all the, the big moves that happen in our emergency podcast. You can go back and listen to that. But we do have some other news items to quickly run through here on this podcast. Orioles manager Brandon Hyde said that Jackson Holiday will be given, quote, every opportunity to make the team's opening day roster, and the early NFBC ADP is at 206 for Jackson Holiday. Scott, if we do get that any inclination or if he's hitting well in in uh, spring training, how high does this climb? I mean, does it get ahead of like a Churio and, and Wyatt Langford? What do you what do you think about Holiday's potential ADP? Well, I have him ranked pretty high already. I'm pretty optimistic he's going to make the opening day roster. I think I I understand this is only I guess the second year, this the second spring that this new is it the second or the third that teams are incentivized to have their top prospects make the opening day roster. This will be the third because this the first be the year, third. remember it like you thought the winners in the NL, like Strider or Michael Harris, both didn't qualify. So no one was able to take advantage of that. And then I yeah. I don't remember the AL situation. Julio, but Julio got it. Julio yeah, got yeah. It. and Julio. Julio was the only one that came through with it. That's right. So yeah. it's 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 really complicated the way this works, and which is why I never give the full explanation. But, you know, if a team has a potential to earn bonus draft picks if they're if, if a prospect of theirs is on the roster for their entire rookie season from opening day to end of the season, and then goes on to place high enough in different awards votings over the first few years of their career. But the, the key to it all is they have to be on the roster from the beginning and remain on the roster. Um, and it's, I, I wasn't sure that that would matter more to teams than, than extra control. And that they it would really stop service time manipulation, but early evidence suggested it has in a, in a major way, and that teams are much, much, much more willing to put their top prospects on the opening day roster. And Jackson Holiday, the way he basically scaled the Orioles' entire system, um, leads me to believe he's got the inside track on winning that job this spring because he's going to be up at some point next year. 
are they going to hold him down all the way till August so that he retains rookie eligibility until next year and has a shot at? I doubt that. I doubt that. Like this is his year. This is going to be his rookie season. And so if that's the case, if you're the Orioles, wouldn't you want a shot at draft pick bonuses by just having him there from the beginning? I, I would think so. I would I would think Jackson Holiday is going to be good enough in spring training to justify that. So I, I have him already. I think he's my 14th shortstop, uh, which overall would put him. I'd need a minute to open it up. Overall, it would put Jackson Holiday. I have him 159th. So about the same range as we were talking about with some of those other other guys. The other thing I want to just add to that I would watch is we speculated on the other part the emergency pod we did where I said, like, listen, I think this is where the Orioles make their move. Like the Orioles, they got Kimbrel, they paid a bunch of money, make your move now. And they have such a glut of great talent in the in their minors. If they go and trade, let's just for argument's sake, say they go and make one of those big moves and they trade a, maybe a Kobe Mayo, which probably would be a mistake, or a Heston Kerstad or um, a Connor Norby or whatever they decide to do. If they deplete the system, even more reason for them to have Jackson Holiday up so you can replenish it. Even more reason that you can go make that trade when you have a potential front runner to win rookie of the year and get what is essentially a first round pick. I mean, I think a trade all but is a precursor to Jackson Holiday breaking camp because this team has won compensation for Gunner and they very likely could do it again. So I, I, I think that would be something I'd watch for if they do deplete that system a little bit. All right. Angels GM Perry Manassian said that Mike Trout will not be traded this offseason. Didn't say anything about uh, in season. White Sox reliever Gregory Santos might not be ready for the start of spring training due to a right elbow injury. Some names to pay attention to at the back end there. Garrett Crochet, Luis Patino maybe hasn't really worked out as a starter, maybe back end bullpen type reliever. They could sign a veteran. I mean, maybe like a David Robertson, Dylan Floro type, uh, or Gregory Santos might just be healthy by spring training. So we'll have to wait and see. Uh, Frank, before you go any further in the news, I don't know if you saw my comment in the chat. Uh oh. Oh yeah. Was, this is the one. This is why I, I I scoffed when you were like, we got some news to talk about. I was like, I can't even believe this one still. Oh god. Jamer Candelario. Jamer Candelario to the Reds. To the Reds. To the Reds. The team, of course, when you think who needs a corner infielder, you think Phew, Cincinnati, Cincinnati Reds. The guy okay. that oh, India's gonna play first. Spencer Steer, we'll find a spot. Christian Encarnacion Strand. Candelario is there to play presumably first base third base. I know yeah. he's third baseman, but what are you going to do? Are you going to put Matt McLean at second Elliot short? Maybe, maybe that is the move by it's the way. Mess. No, it's a mess. Like, like we already thought the reds were overloaded and they didn't have enough at bats to distribute between all those young infielders. And now you add Jamer Candelario to, I mean, look, good news for Candelario. Like he's going yeah. to the most Homer friendly park. He hits a lot of doubles. You got to think some of those doubles are going to turn into homers and, and, uh, you know, might verge on must start status in in fantasy in Cincinnati, provided he's playing every day. I presume he is. Spencer Steer, though. Right. Like I've been worried about Spencer Steer losing playing time already. I that's that's kind of been one of my one of the reasons I've I've been ranking Spencer Steer unfavorably is because I I thought he just on pure talent, he might get pushed out of that mix. Uh Noel V. Marte, I thought was a really opened my eyes last year when he, in his stint with the Reds. And I thought, um, you know, I, I thought he might be one of the favorites for rookie of the year based on the way that stint went, assuming he was going to be the Reds everyday third baseman. I don't know. Somebody suggested when I was tweeting about the Jamer Candelario signing that maybe they're gearing up to trade a couple of those infielders for Dylan Cease or somebody like that which is a possibility. And we, Jonathan India has been rumored to be trade bait for a while now. And they just missed out on Eduardo. There was a rumor that they were one of the teams that was in on Eduardo Rodriguez who signed with the Diamondbacks. So yeah, you start penciling some of those things in. Maybe you have a trade. They've got tons of young pitching. Uh, apparently the rumor was that the uh, White Sox had asked for Rhett Lauder, who is one of their top pitching prospects. They probably don't want to do, but maybe you move a, uh, 
a steer or maybe you move an India and pitching prospects or steer and uh, India with, I mean, it's going to take a lot for cease to happen, but they just gave themselves flexibility. If they're, I don't think this move to me, this isn't the precursing move to like, okay, well now we can trade India. I don't think you needed to do that. This right. screams to me something bigger of like a strand or a steer and steer mm -hmm. does kind of seem like the guy that's working his way out for whatever reason. But let's presume that doesn't happen. Who are you lowering based on this? I think Incarnacion Strand. India. He's I not. mean, India for sure. Yeah. Like without question, he has, doesn't have a home. He, they, they said they're going to play him at first base here. So there's no home. But I think Steer and Strand seem questionable to me without any clarity. Like what is Strand the everyday DH or is he just the versus righties DH? And well, what about Noel V. Marte? You think? Yeah. Where does Noel V? I mean, well, in this scenario, if he's playing, if Ken Candelario is playing first, Noel V could still play third. Yeah. Ellie is still short and Matt McLean is second. Okay. That's yeah. what the early roster resource has is Candelario at first, Matt McLean at second, Ellie De La Cruz at short, Noel V. Marte at third, and Carnacion Tran at DH. And Spencer Steer in left field, which he did play some outfield last year. Jonathan India is on the bench. That is what they have right now. And there was a report recently that India could play some first base or DH. It's not happening. I mean, with this move, he's just, to me, he's completely on the outside looking in. And maybe that's not fair to him. Maybe they try him in an outfield spot as well, something like that. I think India for sure is part of some kind of trade, either for, even if it's not for a big name starter. It's probably for a starting pitcher. I think that that probably happens at some point this offseason. Yeah. I mean, White Sox just lost yeah. to Anderson, just thrown out. So, yeah. All right. So, interesting stuff there. It's great news for Candelario, by the way. I mean, he, his ADP is going to jump up. I mean, he's probably still a corner infielder, but he was really, really good this year. And now he goes to Cincinnati. So, I don't really want to. Yeah discount that for uh for Kansas. also I, I will i will give you the expected home run <laughs> that's i just went to go look at that and say we have to look at what the expected number is here we it's were the just, only thing we care about you know we were just dismissing down, the I, i'm gonna lose it if it goes down i'm gonna lose it we were just dismissing the legitimacy of the expected home run number when we were talking about juan soto on the on the um emergency podcast so you know take this with a grain of salt but if he, if Jamer Candelario had played every game in Cincinnati last year, according to Statcast, he would have hit thirty home runs. His career high is twenty two. It's the only park that gave him thirty home runs. Every other park was close to in line to twenty five and thirty for Great American Ballpark. You know, I love Statcast. I totally buy it. A great like, number. I'm, I'm totally buying Jamer Candelario entering twenty twenty four. Man. It's a good problem to have. Uh, we'll, we'll see what the Reds do. I, I have a feeling they're going to be uh, wheeling and dealing a little bit here. Wait, 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 wait. wait. I got to, I got to come up with this. I got to come up with this. Where, where do I slot him in my third base rankings? All right. Well, okay. do I, do I move him ahead of Noel V Marte, who I love? I have Noel V Marte 13th. I have Junior Comanero 12th. Both of those might be a little optimistic already. Spencer Steer 11th. Do I stick him there right behind Steer? Because currently I have Candelario 22nd. He's got to move think, up a lot, right? Does I really, ahead? I really think Steer is getting himself into a platoon. I don't care if they list him at left. I think there's maybe they make it work out totally, but I probably ding Steer before I ding Marte. Okay. Who do you have okay. just behind Candelario? Okay, I mean, so uh, Caminero. Uh, okay, so the third base is pretty crowded. So I have uh, just behind Caminero is Noel V. Marte. Just behind him, Max Muncy. Max Muncy or Candelario? Ooh, Max Muncy expected. Ooh, a bad average. That's close. I, I don't want to do the Will Myers thing we did with Candelario from a couple Jake, of years. Like, yeah. I'm a little afraid well, of that. Yeah, but I'll say Muncie. I'll say I'll Muncie. say Muncie Jake, too. Jake Burger or Candelario. Ooh, I'm gonna go with Burger. I like Burger, man. Yeah, good that's, burger. That's, and then I have Josh Young. I know I'm down on Josh Young. I have him behind Burger. So I, I assume you guys would go Josh Young over Candelario. I might go Candelario over. It's some big strikeout numbers with Young. Okay, so you're a downer on Young like me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ke Brian Hayes or Candelario? Candelario. Candelario, but is that the sweet spot? I think that. Yeah, I think right around Burger. So he's still he's still going to be like 
Berger if that's versus- a sweet spot, he's only 17th in the third base rankings, which I think is, for me anyway, which I think is a testament to third base more than yeah. anything else. Like it's just Maybe clarity, he moves up a little bit more. Like once we get some... Uh, just a tiny bit more clarity. Like, what does this roster look like? What are they doing? What, you know, I'm not saying that you sign Candelario to not obviously play him every day, but there's just, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of mouths to feed there and it seems muddy. Um, and like I said, the, the, I, I have a little bit of that Will Myers taste in my mouth from last year where we're like, Oh my God, he's going to be such yeah, a 2020 right. guy, but blah, blah, like, blah. But, but I, I mean, obviously Candelario has, I mean, Will Myers Story was track barely record. playing prior to joining the Reds, and Cantillaria is in a different state of his career. Yeah, I, I suppose. All right, well, Jamer Candelario to the Reds. Let's take our final break. I have some other news items, some other prospects. <laughs> it's been a long night. Do we'll, you? We'll do all that right after this. On the next NFL Monday QB, with only a month left on the regular season calendar. The Week 14 slate is filled with divisional rivalries. Go under center on the only NFL show all about quarterbacks. Monday on CBS Sports Network. You know, I don't want to complain about moves happening because I'm happy that they're happening for baseball. But did they really all just have to happen in one night within like a two-hour span? Like, it's just, there's so much happening. We're going on like a record, like... Yeah, we're almost doing like a like just a twenty four hour podcast. Like we're just never gonna end. People don't probably realize how long we've been going. We're just gonna uh, keep going. We're not, we're gonna about to end the show, and then it'll be like, by the way, Shohei Otani, and we'll just never be able to end. This show. Don't, don't even you know you're gonna speak it into existence. <laughs> Where did we leave off? Astros GM Dana Brown said that uh, Chaz McCormick will be an everyday player in 2024, and the team is committed to Jake Myers getting the bulk of starts in center field. Marlins plan to stretch AJ Puck out during spring training as they consider him for a rotation spot, which hasn't really ever worked out in the past. Apparently, the Rangers, Yankees, and Astros are all interested in reliever Robert Stevenson, who turned into a brand new pitcher after joining the Tampa Bay Rays in June, because that's what they do. In 42 games with Tampa Bay, Robert Stevenson had a 235 ERA, a .68 whip. 14K per nine, 1.9 walks per nine, and a 28.7% swinging strike rate. That's unreal. Uh, I really would like Robert Stevenson to go somewhere that he could be a closer. I don't know that it will happen. The Rangers, I guess it could happen. The Yankees, it could happen. Astros, probably not. Uh, Other Yankees news, Aaron Boone said, oh, I talked about this already. Jason Dominguez, not guaranteed to immediately step in as the team's starting center fielder when he returns to full health. Uh, Boone also said that Nestor Cortez recently began a throwing program and uh, Cortez was limited to just 12 starts this past season due to a left shoulder issue. Anthony Rizzo is expected to be fine for the start of spring training after dealing with post-concussion syndrome this past season. And DJ LeMahieu is slated to be the team's starting third baseman. And there's more. Smaller moves. Eric Fetty signed a two-year, $15 million deal with the Chicago White Sox. Fetty is returning from the KBO where he just won the MVP. He went 20-6 wow. and six with a 2.0 ERA and a .95 whip. And I don't know he's a name that will... He's not going to be drafted okay. in every league to start, Scott, but... Like he Eric should. Fetty is probably going to be a streamer at some point. He should. I'm bullish on Eric Fetty. Ooh. He was the he was the MVP. He was the Cy Young. That even two ERA struck out 209 batters. Uh, this is the league too. I mean, Korea. You know, it's it's considered even lesser than Japan. But it, you know, that's where Merrill Kelly revitalized his career with much much worse numbers. I will point out than the ones Fetty just put up, and even more than okay, he went to Korea and dominated were the changes he made in the off season prior to going to Korea, where he went to, um, uh, you know, he joined one of those facilities, uh, push performance work workout facility and remade his mechanics, remade his entire arsenal, picked up the sweeper and split change that Logan Webb throw. This is coming yep. from Brian Bannister, the white Sox pitching advisor. Logan Webb, of course, is known mostly for his extreme ground ball rate led all qualifiers last year with a 62% ground ball rate. Eric Fetty's ground ball rate in Korea, 70%. 70%. And like I said, you know, he had well more than a strikeout per inning in a league where strikeouts aren't as common. So 
Like given, you know, given the history there with Merrill Kelly, the comp to Logan Webb, the incredible numbers, the extreme ground ball rate. You know, on the emergency podcast, we were talking about Eduardo Rodriguez signing with the Diamondbacks, and I was kind of meh on him. I think I like Eric Fetty more. I think I need to rank him as a top 60 pitcher for me next year. Scott is in. Like, oh, wow. In. wow. Hopefully he has a defense to help him out. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody That's true. With ground end? balls. You need yeah. some fielders. I, I love that ground ball rate. I don't know who's going to be uh, getting those outs, but yeah, you know, Nicky Lopez is good. Yeah, Nicky Lopez and Paul DeYoung up the middle. What could oh, go what we've always wanted. <laughs> uh, but no, definitely some interesting notes there on Eric Fetty. Good and notes. My guess is that he, he will factor in as a, uh, a viable pitcher in fantasy at some point this year. The Rangers signed Kirby Yates to a one-year $4.5 million deal who turns 37 years old in March. He was solid this past year, uh, first year back from injury with the Atlanta Braves. And I think there's at least a chance that he could factor into the Rangers' closer mix. He does have experience in that role, uh, so we'll have to watch that closely. Kirby Yates and obviously Jose Leclerc in the back end of the Rangers' bullpen. The Braves quickly turned around and uh, shipped Marco Gonzalez off to the Pirates for cash considerations and a player to be named later. The Astros signed Victor Caratini to be their backup catcher behind Yiner Diaz. The Astros also traded for reliever Dylan Coleman, who throws hard but has no idea where it's going. The uh, Angels signed reliever Luis Garcia for a one-year $4.25 million deal. The uh, Nationals signed Juan Yepes to a minor league deal, and he'll have a chance to compete for their first base job. Turns 26 years old in February. Took a step back this past year, but he was awesome in the minors in both 2021 and 2022. You know, Wells, I, I think that could turn out to be a sneaky one. If Juan Yepes is a starting first baseman for the Nationals, he might matter. I don't disagree with you. You know, it's interesting. The 2000. Um, all the season 2022 off season he got really sick in the dominican winter league and lost like 20 or 25 pounds and he was working back through that and i think a lot as weird as it is i think a lot of that kind of set back some of that training regimen and maybe even some of those big hard hit numbers that we knew he just didn't seem right this entire year i wonder if a fresh off season a fresh start and fresh opportunity maybe opens up because we've seen some big offensive numbers from him. So yeah, I kind of agree. The nationals did interesting. We didn't mention it because there's a million things, but rule five draft just happened today. And the nationals actually took someone from the Arizona fall league, Nassim Nunez. And that means they have to keep him on the roster. And he's just really high in defense, a shortstop who makes actually some pretty good contact. And it's like, okay, maybe they're going to put out a roster with guys like Juan Yepes and Nassim Nunez. You never know what's going to end up happening. A couple of interesting Rule 5 guys out there. He was the one, one of the ones that stood out. They also drafted, uh, the White Sox drafted, I think, Shane Dronin, who was one of the top picks who could be a rotation piece as well when we're talking about the White Sox rotation. So um, just a random thing to throw out there as far as uh, oddities of the Rule 5. But the Nationals are going to give some opportunities some players, so don't sleep on Yepes. I actually saw that the uh, Guardian selected Davison De Los Santos, yeah. formerly of your Arizona Diamondbacks. Well, a speculative thing out there is, first off, why the hell would they do that? It's a double A hitter who's been, you know, trying to find his hit tool and defensively has maybe struggled a tiny bit. I think he's massively talented, but not to the level where he would make the majors. Some speculating maybe that's something that they could try to work out at the major league level to manipulate some service time of another first baseman we're aware of um, in comments, Ardo, because there's a lot of lefties out there that I don't know if that would happen, but I saw some um, insider guardians, people speculating the same thing. That was the weirdest of all of them. The young Davis and De Los Santos, who is not ready being selected. Uh, yeah. Some weird rule five stuff. All right, so uh, this is normally the time when we wrap up the podcast. We have talked about five outfield prospects. You know I, will leave it, I will leave it up to you guys. What I'll, do we do? <laughs> I'll hang up and listen metaphorically. I'll still sit here. But if, if you just want the Welsh to breeze through these next guys, like I'm fine with that. I, I don't, I don't want to have to devote another pro podcast to outfield prospects. I, why don't I just give the last five? And, and if there's any note that you want to do here, uh, Frank, or you, know, you could obviously give the last five, or if you want to throw any notes on it, uh, and I can editorialize. But James Wood was six, Pete Crow Armstrong, seven, 
I like Spencer Jones with the Yankees a lot more than other people. Chase at eight, Chase to Louder, who we saw in the AFL at nine and 10, Walker Jenkins from this draft. And there is a really kind of big swing of these different players. Pete Crow in the majors. Um, Walker Jenkins, the farthest away from the majors. DeLauder would make sense now, but James Wood is the most polarizing of all of those players. And he's kind of lost a little bit of that pedigree that everybody was super excited about because the strikeouts just got exponentially worse this past year. But he is a, he's really a 30 20 potential player. I just don't know how the development of the Nationals ends up going. I can tell you, he came out here and trained a little bit out here in Arizona. He's best friends with Jackson Merrill and they were hanging out a bit. So I get encouraged of, you know, hopefully that training. I think he was even maybe training with Merrill a little bit. So maybe that's outside of the, the Nationals, but I'm still optimistic. But he is the biggest strikeout risk. And I think we talked about this a long time ago. Someone had brought up, like, hey, who is the prospect that could most resemble a guy like Ellie de la Cruz? And it's like, well, from so many points, it's James Wood, the physicality, um, the pure raw tools are there. There are strikeout issues. I just don't know if he'll hit for average. He has definitely got into points with that. But this bottom five is massively talented with a lot of different types of players, though speed is pretty pronounced through the majority of it, except for Chase DeLauder, who we just saw in the AFL, Frank. And that, I think, is one of the most poised hitters out there. It's just going to be when they're ready for opportunity. So those are still top 25 prospects uh, in that entire group there. Um, but James Wood is probably the most prolific. All right, I think I'm just going to kind of power through each of them and maybe give you a quick question on each. You talked about the strikeouts with James Wood. Similarly with Spencer Jones, I mean, they're both a similar size. They're six foot six. They're over 230 pounds. These are big dudes. You mentioned how much you like Spencer Jones compared to, I guess, the rest of the prospect community. Yeah. He also strikes out a lot. 29% yeah. strikeout rate. How much does that worry you? Yeah. Any strikeout rate worries me, but I see 40 strikeouts from a 240 pound, six foot six outfielder. And I'm like, okay, you know, when we could do something with this, I don't think he's even tapped into the pure raw power. He hit 16. He had 29 doubles though, in 117 games. He is super, super fast. You're still young enough in this game. I'd also point out he was a two-way player in college at Vanderbilt. He was a pitcher. He was a very highly regarded pitcher. So that hitting might still be a little bit behind. I think he's crazy, crazy tooled up. I saw a rumor, by the way, at one point that he was going to be involved in this Soto trade, and that did not end up happening. But I like, you want to talk about, again, skill set, Spencer Jones. He is, I, I'm probably overrating him to what the market feels, but he's a dude. All right, Pete Crow Armstrong. We did see him for a, uh, a very brief cup of coffee with the Cubs in September played 13 games. He had zero hits across 19 plate appearances, modest power definitely has speed. He's known mostly for his 80 grade glove. Will he hit enough? And is he up on opening day? What do you think about PCA uh, opening day? I'm going to at this moment say yes. And I think he hits better than most people believe, but I am questioning the power. I'm a little worried he becomes like a Nico Horner type, like almost similar profile. He's got better power projection, but maybe he's a, you know, 10 to 12 homer, 35 stolen base guy. I think he will make a big impact, but yeah, I'm, it might be a little too soon. This year might not actually be it. All right, Chase DeLauder. We saw him out in the AFL. So poised. The plate discipline was awesome. Looks like he has power and speed. The problem is that he's kind of been limited because of injuries so far in the minors, only 57 games this past season. Do you think we see him up at some point this year with the Guardians? 100%. 100% we see him up. Uh, I'd love to see him earlier. I don't think that's the case. I think they're going to challenge him a little bit more. AFL was pretty good. It wasn't phenomenal. 57 games. Those are his pro games this year. So I think it's just too soon, but we will see him up this year. He is uh, massively selective with incre incredibly big raw power. He can run too. He was running in the AFL. It'll just be curious to see. Like people are going to hate his swing. That he's got this Mike Trout more pronounced Mike Trout stop. You know, right off of contact type of swing, and that gets people weird. But he makes it work. He makes it work with huge raw power. I love Chase Delauder. Last one on Walker Jenkins, your number ten outfield prospect. He was taken fifth overall in this year's draft by the Minnesota Twins. Where is he in your first year player draft rankings? 
Yeah, he's in the top five. Him and Max Clark, they're a really tough thing. Max Clark had a really bad pro debut and quite a bit smaller. Walker Jenkins is an Adonis type of dude, six foot three, 215, six stolen bases, hit 362 in his pro debut. Rave reviews out of uh, rookie ball. Walker Jenkins, is, I, I can tell you, he has been going in some instances as the number three overall in first year player. And the cheap plug I just did, you guys both took part in it. My first year, or my, uh, I call them the P180P mocks, where I get a bunch of different drafts and I make a prospect ADP out of them and I put them on my Patreon at in this league.com. And I'll have that up probably in the next week or so. Walker Jenkins was going like 12 in a league or two overall. So Walker Jenkins is the hype player right now. Yeah, raise your hand if you took Walker Jenkins in the second round. <laughs> oh, Frankie, <laughs> I didn't get him. Uh, let's go. All right, so let's quickly recap the top 10 outfield prospects entering 2024. This is via the Welsh's prospect ranks. Wyatt Langford up at number one, followed by Jackson Churio, Dylan Cruz, Evan Carter, Jason Dominguez, and then James Wood, Pete Crow Armstrong, Spencer Jones, Chase DeLauder, and Walker Jenkins. Can can I ask about one more who I'm sure would be in a lot of people's top 10? Sure. Roman Anthony of the Red Sox. What do you he think? Is. He is in a lot of those. Um, he was a very, uh, you're going to be probably shocked when I get the ADP together. I like Roman Anthony. I just don't like him as much as everybody else. Uh, good numbers, 14 homers, 16 stolen bases. He hit 272. He was able to move the three levels, which you love. And he did that fun little, I got better across the board. Um, but I think he's, he's, I don't want to call him, he's fringe to this conversation. He belongs in that 25 to 40 overall range. And I think he's somewhere between, you know, 11 and 14, as far as outfielders go. Like if you liked him more than Lazaro Montes, or you like him more than Kevin O'Contra, yeah, that's fine. He might be a better hitter in some instances, yeah. but I'm, uh, I'm not as enamored as everybody else with, I think Roman if Anthony. you like exit velocity and you like plate discipline, then you like Roman Anthony. Yeah. 86 walks in 106 games. So like, this is going to be big and, and a 400 OBP OBP push for sure on Roman Anthony. Yeah, he just got up to double A, played 10 games at the double A level as a 19 year old. So he is moving fast. Again, that's Roman Anthony, outfielder with the Boston Red Sox. And very quickly, your top five proximity prospects to know uh, for redraft leagues obviously, Wyatt Langford, Jackson Churio, Evan Carter, Pecor Armstrong. One name we haven't mentioned yet, Heston Kierstad with the Baltimore Orioles for now. We'll see if he uh, gets moved anywhere in a trade. Former first round pick from 2020 was a second overall pick in that draft has definitely dealt with a lot of stuff in the minors from injuries, myocarditis, but he just played his full first full season in the minors and he was awesome. He hit over 300, 21 homers, 904 OPS. He is ready to go. He was up late in the season. It's just about find, finding playing time. Where is he going to play? If he gets moved in like a Dylan Cease kind of trade, then yeah, he's probably playing for a, for a team like that, wherever he gets moved. He'll probably be an everyday player. Definitely a name to know, Heston Kierstad. We're going to wrap there for Scotty and the Welsh. I am Frank. Thanks, as always, for tuning in to Fantasy Baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. And we will be back again next week. Bye-bye.